What's up, guys? It's Friday. Welcome to SJU. Joe, Dan, Roxy, and we've got a very special guest, Zach Stentz, writer of Thor, first class, friend good of the to channel. Be here. Dude, it's really good to have you. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about today. Uh, you have a movie coming out, uh, Rim of the World, on Netflix. We're going to talk a little bit about that today. Excellent. I look forward to talking about it. <laughs> Zach, of course, the first, I, I believe, yeah. Joe, yeah. the first person involved, directly involved with the film to come on Screen Junkies and do an honest trailer uh, a reaction with us, which yeah. was amazing. It opened the doors for us to do it with other people. So thank you, Zach. Oh, wow. You, you were yeah. the first. The innovator. I, I, the, you know, the gatekeeper. The first, but definitely not the last. <laughs> You've had much bigger names than than uh, than me since no. then. But the you know, writers have all the dirt. You, you know, know what? Your true love always comes back. <laughs> and here I am. Uh, before we get into the room of the world, though, uh, some small Batman news dropped yesterday. So we're going to get into that. Just, you know, tidbits. Yeah. Uh, it didn't big. blow up very big yesterday. We're hoping people click on, you know, the, the title to talk about it. No way. Uh, it's too yeah, small of a story. Yeah. So we're, we're going to talk Batman casting. Then we're going to get into some of uh, your questions today. Let's jump into Batman. Uh, this is via deadline. Robert Pattinson and Nicholas Holt are the shortlist to be the new Batman. Um, so this was reported first as Robert Pattinson is Batman, and then it was sort of uh, corrected to be like he's probably the Batman, but Nicholas Holt right on his tail. Yeah. Uh, Variety's still running with yeah. he is the Batman. Okay. Like, I checked this morning, Variety's like, no, Stand firm. he's Batman. Okay. And um, they were the ones who came out with the story first. Yeah. And they said he is Batman, and then everybody else within 15 minutes released that he either be. he was Batman or he might be, and Nicholas yeah. Holt is right <laughs> there. Nicholas Holt's agents were like, Calling, yeah, no, no, calling no. everyone yeah. on the phone. Yeah, uh, yeah honestly, I kind of feel like that's hunt. what it is. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. A source who is definitely not Nicholas Holt's agent says that he's still yeah. up for the role. Holt is hot, nigga. Yeah. <laughs> well, that is just such a bummer for Nicholas Holt, though. If A, that's how he found out he didn't get it, mm -hmm. or B, he still does think he is in the running. Yeah, this I would much rather look. be the Batman than be the subject of essays years from now of videos that are people who are like, people who are almost Batman. Like, I'd rather be Batman. I, I think. Such I think Nicholas Holt's going to be okay. I don't think I agree. this is, even if he doesn't get it, he is not going to be the Dugray Scott of, uh, <laughs> of uh, Batman. I do agree. Uh, so No offense to Dugray. So uh, before we get into these guys, uh, just again, some details and some context on the movie. This is the Matt Reeves, the Batman, uh, mm -hmm. that he is directing off of his own script. Uh, this is for a 2021 release. Uh, the studio and Matt Reeves, they wanted a younger Batman, uh, and this script has widely been reported as a very strong noir influence, uh, focusing on the the detective that you know Batman is supposed to be. Uh, Holt's 29, which was how old Christian Bale was when he was announced as Batman. Pattinson is 33, but still looks 19, which is very frustrating. Uh, so let's let's talk about these guys. These are two guys with really strong filmographies. Uh, either of them can can pull this off. What are your initial reactions? Yeah, I mean they're both fantastic. They've both they've both obviously done big franchise films, mm -hmm. and they've both done a lot of indies as well. And uh, I, you know, was uh, was Cedric Diggory Pattinson's first big role, or was yes. he a child I actor the way Nick so. Holt was? That was sort of his breakthrough. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, that's kind of the advantage too. Is thinking about because so many people just. Twilight, 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 Twilight. Just like, that was and, over ten years ago. Yeah, and the dude has spent the last like five or six years working with like the creme de la creme of indie yeah. directors, yes, yeah. getting really good review, getting really good reviews for indie films. It's actually a lot like the way Christian Christian Bale, who let's remember Newsies. Um, was I, I think doing things like, today, yeah. uh, you know, was doing things like American Psycho and Laurel Canyon and mm -hmm. all kinds of interesting indies him, himself. Yeah, yeah. I just uh, Nicholas Holt, I think, has the advantage of having broken out when he was younger, and so people are like, oh, I watched him grow up and mature into a fine actor. Whereas uh, Robert Pattinson uh, appeared in a lot of the same kind of stuff, but he was older, and so people are like, he's that forever. It's like, no, he no. he matures just as Nicholas Holt. Like you mature in your career, you mature as an actor. Um, Good time is an incredible movie. And everybody that I saw, like, cause I, I'm on, I'm on board. If it's Pattinson, I'm on board. If it's Holt, I'm on board. I think they're both great. I think they're both interesting actors. What I'm do excited. you think? 
Well, this is your moment to jump up and down and say, I told you so, Roxy. A hundred percent. I mean, I've been I've been singing Pattinson's praises for a long time, mostly because of Good Time and even because of some of the indie movies I didn't love, but I loved him in, like Damsel from last year. I think that he is a star, and I feel like he's gotten stuck in this Twilight, I don't age trap based off his character. I think Pattinson's the perfect fit, I will say. Nicholas Holt doesn't particularly do it for me. Mm. Uh, I can't picture him as Batman. I can picture him as Bruce Wayne all day, but I can't picture him as Batman. Interesting. Uh, and that doesn't mean he wouldn't be a great one because I'm not a casting director, so it's not my job to always picture these people. I'm sure he would be <laughs> totally fine, but when I think, who do I want to be my Batman, after talking about this every single week for the past multiple years, after losing Batfleck from being the director, producer, writer, and star of this to all of those transitions, I think Robert Pattinson is the perfect pick. Well, uh, Dan, you said something interesting yesterday. You made a really good point. Uh, where both of these guys, I think it in, in it reflecting on what this script is probably like, because yes. both of these guys are franchise guys. Uh, obviously, Twi- he made an insane amount of money to do Twilight. Holt maybe uh, not as giant as a franchise guy with X-Men, but still, he was a franchise actor. None of these guys are desperate for that, a Batman paycheck. If it's Pattinson in particular for me, is like he made an otherworldly amount of money for those last few Twilight movies, mm-hmm. like an ungodly amount of money. He's had the fame, and not only has he had the fame, he didn't have a particularly sterling, wonderful experience with having that kind of fame. And so, and if you look at his choices, those three things together, to me, actually give me a lot of hope about the project, because if Pattinson's interested and wants to do it, like this is a guy who doesn't need fame, and he doesn't need money. And as a matter of fact, he's seen the dark side of particularly what fame can do. I mean, the, there's no one sure. whose life was more intruded upon by the overwhelming amount of fame he got than Robert you, Pattinson. You don't forget you had Donald Trump before he was president yeah. tweeting about his relationships. Yeah. The, the oh, guy, God, I did forget yeah. all about that. The guy doesn't need exposure. So yeah. to me, if He's you look good. at his choices, that that to me uh, gives me a lot of faith in the, in the script and the project because if a guy like Robert Pattinson who has not been chasing fame or big roles in the last however many years and going toward projects that are interesting and unique, if he's interested in this project, that gives me a lot of hope. I completely agree, and I think what's really fascinating is that a lot of people, when they saw the news that Pattinson broke, but then, is it Pattinson? Questioned, okay, so this must be a contractual issue. So maybe that they're fighting over money. I think there's no shot that that's what's going on right Mm -hmm. now. I don't think that Robert Pattinson is sitting there saying, okay, if you write a bigger check, then I will sign on. I think that this probably has to do with creative and him wanting some kind of say there as he's been taking on his other projects as well and we know that Reeves uh, has been very very protective over the creative so I think that they're just kind of dotting some I's and crossing some T's and making sure that they're both on the same page yeah I, I mean my bottom line is that Matt Reeves has shown himself to have impeccable taste with casting, and yeah. I trust him. I, I'll, I'll rewind to, uh, to 2009, 2010, when we were going through the casting process on Thor, and there was a lot of skepticism when this unknown Australian surfer dude got announced when bigger names like Charlie Hunnam and Alex Skarsgård had been thrown around, mm-hmm. and people were back, you know, like, I like Eric from True Blood. Um, who's this yeah. guy? The, the the headlines around that were so just dismissive and like and, Marvel and, rolls the dice on this guy. Yeah, yeah, and my bottom line was was it's like, look, man, Bronog knows actors and knows acting, and if he was sitting in those endless casting sessions and came out of them saying this is the guy, then this is the guy, yeah. and indeed he. Flash forward ten years later, he was the guy. Yeah. Well, because you 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 co-wrote um, first X Men First Class too, which that Nicholas Holt obviously a big part in yeah. that franchise. <laughs> we thought that we weren't going to get Nicholas Holt, even though everyone really wanted him because, and again, this was 2010. He was uh, spoken for with Fury Road because Fury Road took like eight <laughs> years to took eight right, years yeah. to make out in the out in the desert. And we somehow, I think, managed to get him in that window when the floods forced them out of Australia and into Namibia. <laughs> um, so lucky us and uh, and lucky Nick Holt, I guess. And I think, don't get me wrong, he's a re- 
ridiculously talented actor. Uh, but when you, And dreamy. And super <laughs> duper dreamy. Uh, but when you've spent as much time with the character as anybody uh, that is a fan has at this point, I think everybody, it's such a hard role to fill because everybody has their idea of what is their Batman. Mm -hmm. And at the end of the day, if, Nicolo, if Nicholas Holt gets the job, I'm just going to be on board because we've been proven wrong so many times, even if it's not your Batman. Yeah, well, you know, we can do a memories... Let, let's walk down memory lane. It's like Charlie on, Brown and the football with Batman. It's like yeah. your history just repeating and looping itself. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Keaton. Uh, Hated. Yeah. Mr. Yeah. Mom? Yeah, I'm I'm old enough to remember the, uh, you know, it was pre-internet, but, uh, but there were a lot of angry letters. I, I love, that was how angry people remember back in the day when people <laughs> yeah, they got actually wrote paper. angry letters. Yeah. yeah, I'm such a fan of that though. If you're angry, take out a piece of paper take and start writing. Don't yes. go to your Twitter. Put your return address on it. Yeah. Yeah. Uh huh. In our, in With our a day, we had to be stamped. Yeah. yeah. In our day, we had to make effort to be <laughs> yeah. to, mm -hmm. to be horrible. Yeah. In in our day, we kidnapped authors and brought them to our house and hobbled them. Yes. yes. <laughs> Interesting day. Like, like real Annie, trolls. Like the Annie Wilkeses that. We all are. Yep. No, it's, I like to say the the internet has empowered a million Annie Wilkeses to think that they know better than than the people who are actually creating. Things. Oh yeah, no, absolutely. Well, and and you know, on this on this side, you know, you never have the whole picture. You know, you've been on the other side of the process so many times. How often have you just been so frustrated and just wanted to be like, wait until just wait until you see it. Every time, yeah. <laughs> I, mean, every, I mean, every time there's there's been reaction. Um, you know, there, there was. I mean, X Men First Class. There was so much skepticism about that, and so much. You know, don't don't forget, we we're coming off of the first Wolverine solo movie, mm -hmm. which did. You know, it made a lot of money, but was not beloved. And uh, the Last Stand, um, Ibid. You know, also yeah. that. Um, so there was a you know a lot of skepticism. People sort of liked Matthew Vaughn, but they didn't know what was going you know what was going into this. What do you mean it's going to be a prequel? And then it came out, and people mostly liked it. Yeah. yeah. Based off the way that you've heard this news come out, Zach, do you feel like Pattinson has the job? I kind of feel like he does. I I, I feel like it might be a uh, a kiss kiss bang bang. They're they're keeping Holt in the hunt just to. Uh, mm -hmm. To try and get better terms oh. creatively or something like that, but but my my instinct is that it's going to be is going to be Pattinson. And now, cut to two hours from now. When, <laughs> oh, uh, Nicholas Holt, it, it is. Well, it's weird because I was thinking about it, and I, and it and it brought to mind like there was a brief moment way back in I want to say 2015 when Asa Butterfield was Spider Man. As a, like, I don't it, it remember was that like, at it all. It was like this. It was sort of like this. It was like the news broke. It was like Asa Butterfield has been cast as the new Spider Man. And then the next day, it was like Asa Butterfield is the front runner, but there's four other people, and one of them was Tom Holland. And then it was like, never mind, Tom Holland is Spider Man. Yeah. So I wonder if this is a weird uh, thing where it's, 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 Reported as the possible. news, but then it's not. But then it's somebody. Else. I, I mean, the the other thing that I've seen happen a lot is is things negotiations play out in the press. Mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. Remember when Sam Jackson was supposedly walking away from the Marvel universe? I mean, that was all just a contract thing. Yeah. Or when yeah. Alec Baldwin was cast in the Joker, and we all That's ran right. with that. He was Thomas Wayne. Yeah, and he came out and was like, "Not now, not ever, <laughs> not even in talks." No idea where yeah. you guys picked this up. Maybe this will get some talks and checks started, yeah. but mm, yeah, for now, no, 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 no. I'm rooting. I'm rooting for. I love Nicholas Holt. I think he's a great actor. I think he's one of the better, and I think one of the more, even though he's had some big roles, one of the more underrated younger actors that we have. But I, yeah. On a personal level, I'm I'm rooting for Robert Pattinson just because I think that I just I love his. He gets I, so I'm much unjustified. So curious, black. Yeah. yeah, and I mean, we most I uh, had so many people uh, tweet me yesterday after I was like, I'm all for patents. And be like, oh yeah, weren't you the guy calling him shovel face? Like number one, I didn't write that on his trailer. Number two, <laughs> uh, <laughs> yes, uh, but I, hey, jumped on board as much as anybody. But when we talk about first of all, pro careers change and progress and grow, and mm -hmm. also as time goes on, especially in the internet world, you gain a little bit of perspective about. Uh, how flippant you can be about sure. stuff like that. And it's like, you know, the guy has done, and Chris, by the way, Kristen Stewart too, both of them She's have done, done such really um, 
interesting creative work in the years since. Like you can't just pigeonhole them as one thing. Yeah, yeah I, I'm I, I'm not as much on the Kristen Stewart train simply because I, I loved her so much in her early roles, and there there was so much so much life and vivaciousness there. And and she's felt very like in, incredibly good, but within a range about this about this wide since mm. then. Where's Taylor Lautner? <laughs> that's a very I think good he's question. the one that's just counting his money. I think he parked <laughs> I, my car yeah. down. No, <laughs> no, no, he did not. He, yeah. yeah, that kid. He, he, yeah, he, 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 he had points. Yeah, yeah. he had you, points. You know, uh, sort of on that Twilight note. I mean, there's there's not a person watching, not a person in this building. If someone was like, here's a very popular YA series. We want you involved. Here's the amount you're going to make. We'd hold, we'd all do it. I, I, I want a house. Uh, you know? yeah. <laughs> like, I have to say, yeah. there, there's also a tremendous amount of sexism um, in the subtext of like yeah. Twilight hating. It's like, love or hate the Twilight movies. Are they any worse than a lot of franchises that are kind of that are beloved because they because they hit all of the kind of fanboy because they hit all of the fanboy buttons? Yeah. You know, like That's like fair. I I think it's part of that gatekeeping thing that goes on and drives me nuts of mm -hmm. like of like ooh this is girly let's let's keep it out. You know, I, I feel yeah. like if if there had been some kind of movement of guys that like Twilight, then all of a sudden it would have been fun. It's like uh, My Little Pony like was for girls, it's for kids, but then the story became bronies because all of a sudden uh, 20 year old guys said that it's okay to like My Little Pony. <laughs> and if 20 year old guys had come out and been like, you know what, Twilight's dope, like it would have been such a different story. And that's, that's garbage. <laughs> That's so not fair. Yeah. It is an interesting point, though, because I do find it to be that Kristen Stewart has an easier time than Robert Pattinson or somebody like Shailene Woodley from uh, her Divergent series or Jennifer Lawrence from The Hunger Games. You know, these are all big fan bases that, mm -hmm. um, that I think were more female dominated than male, but still, of course, there was a huge male fan base. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that Robert Pattinson had a really hard time breaking out of that mold when maybe some other people would not have. I think it's because he's chosen to do the Lost City of Z and uh, Cosmopolis and High Life mm -hmm. and Good Time, which are all really well regarded and his performances in those movies are really interesting, but it's not, it's not out there in front of mm -hmm. as many as much of a wide audience. Mm -hmm. uh, so yeah. I think that to, uh, for a lot of people, the last thing they saw Robert Pattinson in was a Twilight movie. And so to him, he's like frozen in time because, yeah. you know, even I think even Kristen Stewart has done bigger movies, not as many blockbuster movies, but bigger movies since Twilight. Yeah, the Robert Runaways Pattinson. movie got yeah. a lot of press. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> you know, it, and w with actors like this, um, the, the interesting thing to me is always when people are like, They'll all, he'll always be the Twilight guy. Or even one-hit wonder bands, like, they'll always be Take On Me, and that's it. And it's like, Take On Me is going to put their great-grandkids to, to <laughs> yeah. college. Was it the you know? like, or what? Yeah, aha. Uh -huh. uh -huh. like, uh, like, Take On uh -huh. Me is cool. Like, the progressive, like, my examples always flow the progressive lady. She's a billionaire. She can go do. She I don't can, know about billion. Not a, I mean, but she's set. Laughing straight to the bank for she, sure. She, uh, she can just. She can open a theater somewhere in the Midwest and just do self-funded plays for the rest of her life. They're set. I All of them are set. I think she's booking a ton right now. Uh, yeah. And she's about to blow up. I heard about something the other day from her, and she was. She I came from uh, Groundlings too, I think. Yeah. Yeah. She did. So. She did. She did. These Still narratives flow. are rewritten in an instant. Affleck was terrible until people saw him in Batman v Superman, and people are now revising. It's revi so, so much mm -hmm. revisionist history about Affleck. Now it's like, Affleck was terrible. Like, no, no. After Batman v Superman, even though a lot of people didn't like that movie, all it was almost universal. People were like, the movie was bad, Affleck was great. Or, I love the movie and I love both of them, or whatever. The, the, the fact that Justice League and now he's gone, it's like, oh, Affleck was terrible. Like, no. Heath Ledger was broke back Joker until the trailer came out, and then it was just like, oh my god, he's the most amazing thing ever. It's like, you were, a lot of the same people that were calling Heath Ledger broke back Joker were calling him broke back Joker until they saw what he was doing, and they're like, oh no, he's brilliant, he's amazing. Why, yeah, why? no, he's the best Joker of all time. Same people at Comic-Con in like, Heath Ledger Joker t-shirts. Yeah, mm -hmm. yep, exactly. Questions for yeah. you guys. Do you believe that this Matt Reeves movie is trying to do a younger, 
Ben Affleck Batman and that is Robert Pattinson? Or do you believe this is on in the multiverse? This is a separate universe? Do you believe that this is just a different timeline? Do you believe it's a different Batman? I think, uh, honestly, I feel like DC is, is just like letting a lot of those definitions fall by the wayside right now and kind of rightfully so and just, just trying to land movies. Um, I'm sure someone somewhere on the Warner lot has like the the red thread room where they're like, here's what it could be. <laughs> but I, I think for now, it's, it's just a Batman movie. So you do not think they're casting him looking to see similarities between him and Ben Affleck? No, okay. no, I don't think so. Yeah, I, I think they're going to take a little bit more of the uh, the the Fox Deadpool, uh, you know, the kind of what they did with the, even the X-Men franchise, a much more casual, Approach to shared universe. I think. I think. Mm -hmm. it, I think this movie is going to start as its own standalone thing, and then maybe if it does really well and people love sure. it, they will figure out a way. And it's like, what do you mean? You know, it's like yeah. the second. There's always this guy has always been Darren. You know, this guy has yeah. always been. Uh, he's always been Batman. Yeah. Exactly. You know, like you. You can. You can just. You can revise continuity on the fly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What do you Easily. think, Dan? Uh, I think this is is, is a. Separate, like the they're Joker, yeah, so it's a separate just, movie. Yeah, I think they're, they've, they've sort of said, we, we did the shared universe thing, we gave it a shot, this is working out much better for us, playing in this, you know, and even uh, even though Aquaman and Shazam are in the shared universe, and I suspect probably with Wonder Woman 1984, that while they are do share a universe, mm -hmm. I think they're, they're going to be much more... Yeah, but they even modular. felt very standalone, like they didn't yeah. need... Yeah. Shazam was an Aquaman both were did, did not rely on any functional mm -hmm. knowledge they didn't interconnect or tie into anything and I'm totally fine with that if if if, yeah. if, if Matt Reeves wants to have his own thing that's great yeah the, the DC has embraced the radical strategy of let's just make good movies first what? and yes. and, <laughs> and figure out the rest later which, which frankly is how the MCU started as started as well. Yeah. You know, yeah. I mean, I mean, they had p vague plans that they were going to go towards the Avengers, but it was all dependent on Iron Man being a good movie. And that is not how the DCEU or whatever we call it, the worlds of DC now the started. The worlds of DC Universe uh, Incorporated. I'm, I'm glad to see that they are implementing this now. Yes. Yeah. Uh, I th yeah. Uh, all cool moves to kind of continue pushing them forward. Uh, hey guys. You like talk about Batman? We're probably going to talk about Batman a lot in the next uh, week or two with all this going on. Uh, so make sure you like, you subscribe. Uh, SJU is our morning show every day, along with a lot of other really cool shows. Uh, 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 Evolution of, from panel to screen, a lot of mm -hmm. cool stuff like that. Um, uh, so make sure you check that out. We also have, uh, you've been watching Watching Thrones every Monday, our Game of Thrones catch-up show. This Sunday night, uh, Spencer and Roth and Michelle are going to go live right after the finale. So that'll probably be 7.38 Pacific yeah, time Yeah, probably. 20, 20 to 30 minutes after the show ends. It's yeah. an 80-minute episode, and then you've got to think Benny Off and Weiss are going to do that 10-minute thing afterwards. Right. So that's going to be 90 minutes. we got to give so. the cast time to pee and all that good stuff. Uh, yeah, and, now, have you have you licensed the song Let the Bodies Hit the Floor yet? For we the, do uh, for need the recap? to. I've been working on it. License. Don't worry. I'll yeah. get it done. In time. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we got to get that done. So make sure you guys check that out. Uh, this Saturday, we're also really, really excited about this show. We've been working on it for months. Uh, we have a show launching called Power Levels. Uh, and basically, this show is we are sort of uh, pitting characters against each other in like an American Gladiator style obstacle course. We're treating the footage from the movies that these characters are in as real footage. We hired a physicist to analyze them so that we can get their speeds, their powers, their strengths, their weaknesses, and they're going through this obstacle course to, de to uh, determine who the best character is. This first episode uh, pits uh, Smaug, Drogon, and the, the Hungarian the, the horn back oh. from uh, horn, back? Horn, horn tail, horn tail from uh, Harry Potter. Wow. Super super cool. What, no uh, vermifax pejorative. No, ver yeah, no, just uh, not enough. Ross uh, was fighting for that. Uh, was she fighting for vermifax? Yes, for many. I've heard nothing but vermifax. Uh, yeah, I, I, was, I was. I was. I was strong in the two. Great cinematic dragon. Have you seen Dragon Slayer? No, it's so not, good. It's 
Actually, Roth is probably so happy. Just one yeah. Roth Cornette's heart. Yeah, yeah you're really just, just, no, I've heard nothing about dragons. Like, well, you know, if Vermithrax was in this, <laughs> he'd, 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 he'd be murdered. Yeah. Yeah. I saw a little bit of the footage the other day. Billy showed me. I was floored. This is unlike anything I've seen you guys do yet, and well, it, uh, it was an awesome thing to be a part of. And I thought it looked amazing. Well, Roxy, who, awesome. who is doing the VO, uh, yes. just segued us perfectly because we got a clip. JTE, Ooh. roll it. Whoa. We pulled what we think are the three strongest dragons from the three most popular fantasy franchises. Drogon from Game of Thrones. The Hungarian Horntail from Harry Potter. And Smaug from the Hobbit movies. For their challenge, we'll make them sprint the distance from Hobbiton to Mount Doom, 1,030 miles as the dragon flies. Then use their breath to melt a wall of ice that's 30 feet thick, 700 feet high, and 300 miles long, the time it takes them to finish these tasks should give us a baseline for cross-franchise comparison. Does Drogon ever refuel, or does he just have the unlimited that ammo? Is, that is we, we, we get in into it. That is addressed yeah. in the episode. And now yeah. I know the answer, but I didn't before. We, we do we do get into it. Uh, the the I, and I apologize. I don't remember his name uh, off the top of my head. I should have written it down. The the scientist we we brought in to do this is Spencer Gilbert. Uh, yeah, Spencer J. <laughs> uh, noted physicist Spencer yes. J. Gilbert. Uh, Honestly, I, I, I this show's going to be fantastic. I honestly wish part of the show was just the Skype calls we had with this guy. They were he's just standing in front of like a particle collider in a That's lab, awesome. and he's like, "Here's what I was thinking about how we measured the, the drag." It, it was just so fun to just sit in and listen to. Uh, uh, this is the pilot episode. Several months have gone into this. Mm -hmm. uh, Spencer's been working his butt off on it. Billy Business has been working his tail off on it. Uh, we really think you guys are going to like it, so please, when it drops, like it, give it some love, share it around, let people yes. know. You are our vanguard. We told you yesterday, you're, you're like, uh, we, we, uh, we love the SGU audience because they are. They're sort of like the, the, the core of like our chorused core, and then it grows out from there. Mm -hmm. But I, You're it's, our it's, chorused core. I think it's like what you said, Roxy, is like it's so different for us yeah. and new and, and something we've never tried before, and uh, we love that, and we want to keep doing it. And uh, part of that is sort of getting the word out there and a lot of times especially on it's going to be on the screen junkies channel a lot of times you try something new you know some people are like oh i don't know you know i'm not sure so if if you watch this and you like it please if you're so inclined we would love for you to leave a thumbs up leave yeah. a comment share it um because we're super excited to be doing something different and yeah. uh we would love to to keep trying to Support do these things. original content people thank you yeah, yeah you know i uh, we know you guys are, are fans. We know you guys love us. And part of staying alive in this business is growing and yeah. evolving and changing and trying new things. And sometimes change is weird and scary, but we're begging you guys to yeah. sort of get behind it and give it a chance. We're <laughs> super excited. And I've yeah. seen the concepts for the episodes that, you know, we're developing. And I think they're cool. Yeah, so it's going to be some fun, fun stuff. Uh, and yes, like Zach said, support original content. Speaking of yeah. original content, let's talk Rim of the World. Let, let's segue. get there. Uh, so, Zach, you wrote the screenplay. It's uh, it's directed by McG. It's coming out on Memorial Day, right? May 24th. May 24th. My mom's birthday. Thank you for watching out for her. I appreciate uh, you know, that. You know, we, we did it just for her. No, so that's the Memorial much. Day weekend. That's not actual Memorial yeah, seven Day. Seven days from yeah. today. Yeah, the okay. Friday of Memorial Day weekend. Mm -hmm. Perfect, perfect. I'm trying perfect. to get you that viewership so, early on. Yeah, so give it. Give us the, like, the elevator pitch, and then uh, we've got a trailer to show everybody. I mean, the elevator pitch is that it's a throwback to the, to the great kid, teen-centric adventure movies of the 1980s, only set in, a contemporary, set in a contemporary time with very contemporary kids. It's essentially four mismatched kids up at summer camp in the San Bernardino Mountains when an alien invasion breaks out. And through circumstances that you will see in the movie, the kids are entrusted with a key that is the key to stopping the to stopping and turning back the alien invasion, but only if they can get it 70 miles across the war zone of, of La Los Angeles under alien invasion, and they <laughs> learn about e learn about themselves, learn about each other, and grow into the heroes that Earth needs them to be in the process. Let's check out that trailer, JTE. Everybody's gone. Look, honey, this summer is going to be great. 
You're gonna make friends. There's nothing to worry about. Welcome to the Rim of the World Adventure Camp. Alex, I am your leader, Logan. I love you. Um... And Dad, where are you going? I don't think we should wander this far. Maybe we should head back? Follow me. What was that? I've never seen anything like them. It's Independence Day. It's June, Gabriel! We just need to wait here until the adults realize they left us. Did you see the size of that thing? Was that an alien? It has a dog! We need to find our parents. We gotta get to the city. Do not move! We're at war. You're not safe here. You gotta go! We can't leave you! Take this key. It's on you now. This is a crypto key. It can activate our satellite defense. We should try to find JPL. It's a NASA facility 70 miles away from here. How are we supposed to go 70 miles? 1973 Ford Mustang Mach 1. I can't drive a stick. Where's the thing? Oh, my God! Put the one on the flam, boy, get temper, just toss that ham in the frying pan. Let's go. Ow! This is Animal Kingdom out here. We have each other. And we can't give up now. I'm your master now. <laughs> no, the line is now I am the master. Okay, we really need to get you a girl. May I propose a toast? Oh, crap, this is from 1969. Could at least get some fresh wine if this is gonna be my first time, right? Ah. How dare yes, you? dude. First of all, congratulations on the best use of insane in the membrane. Uh, I um, wish I could take credit for it, <laughs> but that's all the Netflix trailer department. So uh, I think this looks super, super fun. Uh, I think we were all camp kids. Oh yeah. And uh, right, uh, were you a camp kid? I mean, for like a week at a time. For like a week at a time. That south, like summer camp isn't like a big thing in the south. Uh, the whole south is a summer camp. <laughs> yeah, true. <laughs> fair, 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 fair. You know, uh, yeah. Yeah. No, my my yeah my southern summer camp was like was church camp. Uh, right. So summer camp, yeah. but also uh, uh, go sing some hymns. Uh, but I sort of say that to say like as soon as the trailer opens, like I know those kids. I knew that counselor. Um, I knew all of those interactions with a mom that's like, I love you! And you're like, why are you ruining... My life! Like, out the gate. Yeah, we, we, we milk that. We milk that for all it's worth in the movie. The mom being incredibly embarrassing in, in, front, of all of the, in front of all of the new people at, uh, at camp. Because that, that joke always works. Uh, so, you know, I, I sort of bring up the camp thing because I, I want to sort of get into with you, like, where the story came from, kind of what the genesis of it was. Um, the genesis of the story, it, it, well, it's funny, the genesis of the idea went back to a few years ago um, when I was still working with my writing partner and we got, uh, we uh, were talking to Chris Columbus's co company and they wanted to do, they, they kept talking about how they wanted to do a Goonies sequel. But the problem, they were like, the problem with the, with doing Goonies in, in, you know, I guess it was 2015, with, in 2015 is that modern kids don't have the kind of unstructured time yeah. that 80s kids did. So yeah. they can't have an adventure. And, and all I could think is, well, isn't that interesting, though? How could you put modern kids in an adventure where they don't have their smartphones and they don't have their parents and they don't have adults telling them what to do mm -hmm. and watching them rise to the level of capability of, the, of those 80s kids? And then I was taking my own kids up to their summer camp on Rim of the World Highway in the San Bernardino Mountains. And as I was driving down, I saw like all of the LA Basin spread before spread before me, and I just suddenly had this image of like, wow, what if all of this was a war zone and on fire, and like kids had to ride their bikes down this abandoned highway and in into the in into the valley of death as it as it were, and 
the whole movie kind of grew out of, grew from that image. Are you nervous that if your kids ever see this movie, they'll never go back to camp again? Um, <laughs> no, I, I don't think that's, I don't think that's a danger. They love that, their camp is completely rad. You, you have like, you can have like stuntman electives or you can have LARPing or yeah, cool. it's, it's, it's like the kind of camp we all wish that we had had when what? we were kids. Man, yeah, my camp sucked. <laughs> yeah, I was say, we, man. It's the one, the I mean, one up, one up. <laughs> side of uh, of being a semi successful screenwriter is you get to give your own kids all of the experiences you wish you had had. Our big event was uh, finally the big week where uh, we saw how many fish sticks Aaron could eat in one sitting. And, how many? Uh, I, I think it was like forty six one time. He like pushed forward, which was pretty yeah. impressive. But that wow. was, that was about as big as we got. We did not have a LARPing elective, which I'm very jealous no. of. The co-ed camp though is a whole different experience. I loved I loved watching this trailer, and I think that there is something so eerie about camp too and something so nice about like growing up there and people mm -hmm. being able to connect. I, I mean, the fun thing about using summer camp as kind of the basis for the adventure is one, it gives you a logical place where you can break kids away from away from the adults because yeah. they're already kind of on their own. And if you contrive a situation, in which I do, where they're even away from them and they come back to the camp and it's been abandoned, you know that mm -hmm. that re that really works. But it also gives you all of the summer camp comedy fun of yeah. the great movies like Meatballs and things like that that we that uh, that that I grew up on. Bless, Bless you. you. Thank um, you guys. You know, you you can have fun with the summer camp setting before you literally, as well as figuratively, blow it up when the aliens invade. Yeah. Well, I, I, and I just love that too because, like, with a camp setting, um, you know, on the parents' side, the the nightmare I'm sure is alien invasion happen, you know, something completely out of your control happens while your kids aren't within arm reach. And then for kids at a camp, like everything is, everything is so important. Everything is so amplified. Everything is so heightened. And I think this works so well into like feeding into nostalgia that way. Absolutely. And you hit on something really interesting, which is the st when I was writing this in 2016, before Stranger Things dropped, my agents were telling me not to do it because they were, they were saying like, well, maybe write it, could you write it from the adult's perspective? Because mm -hmm. that's what movies are doing now. They don't, even, even Disney, I remember going to pitch Disney and it's like, okay, if you think of a kid protagonist, can it be Jack Black? Can it be a man? Can it be a man child instead of an actual child? I'm like, you're Disney. <laughs> like, like that's your that's your bread and butter. But we don't make children's movies, movies at the studio. Yeah, but the, the studios, the studios by and large, have run away from movies with kid and teenage protagonists, and those are some of my favorite movies yeah. Yeah. growing up and now. Because when you're a kid or a teen, everything is huge emotionally. Yeah, and and the stakes seem life and death even before you make them life or death. So I very politely told my agents I was going to be writing this anyway. And uh, lo and behold, the thing that everyone told me not to write is like the one thing that gets made. Yeah. Well, we uh, talking about the kids before we went live a little bit, you were talking about the cast a little bit and just how kind of impressive they were and how much fun they were. Oh God, the, the kids were amazing. Uh, um, one of our leads, Jack Gore, um, it, he was the lead, in, the child lead, and the kids are all right. Um, uh, Mia, who plays our female lead, she's going to be in a start in another Netflix movie the week after, uh, playing young Ali Wong in Always Be My Maybe. And then Benji um, has done a ton of Nickelodeon shows. And then Alessio is more of a newcomer, but was like a total natural and looks like a, you know like a olive skinned fourteen year old River Phoenix, which is exactly what we wanted for that for that character. Yeah. I, well, as soon as the moment he sort of shows up on screen I like flashed back to like four different kids that were that kid at camp and you're just like I just wish you would hang out with me yeah. <laughs> like my social currency would rise so high at this place we, uh, we we talk a lot on the show about the changing distribution systems and stuff and the, as we mentioned before you've written for movies that were Marvel movies Fox movies every major studios like is there any difference in doing something with Netflix or is it fit right into the studio experience that this sort of what every movie goes through. It, we are living in a new world, which is which 
is, you know, like Netflix is opening this, you know, on Memorial Day weekend up against Aladdin, and and they're treating it as an entertainment choice, just like going to the just like going to the movies, except mm -hmm. it's you're sitting at home and you press a button on your uh, on on your remote control to see it instead. Um, in terms of development, it was a much leaner development process. Like once they once they said go, we pretty much shot the script that we had. It wasn't like we love this. Okay, now we're going to develop it for three years until everything you loved about it is gone, mm -hmm. um, which is often the studio. Which is often the studio process. So, you know, Netflix really gave us the opportunity to make the kind of movie that the studios aren't making anymore. Um, you've seen them do that in rom-coms as well. They seem to very cannily be moving into those spaces that the studios have abandoned, and it let us, you know, it let us do something at a lower price point than you than you usually see. Nowadays, you know, everything is either like five million dollars or two hundred million dollars. Mm, yeah. Like the middle has fallen out, and this is very much it's at the lower end of the middle but but very much one of those one of those great mid-budget films or i hope it's great um but one of those mid-budget films that uh that again used to be ubiquitous and are now incredibly rare uh well something we, we always like talking about with creators when they come in uh let, let's talk influences for you whether not necessarily just for this movie but just general writing like you know, what sort of what were the movies that you're that were your sort of like creative foundation? I, for this or in general? Just in general, it, yeah. Uh, I mean, in in general, I kind of like you. You cut me open, and I kind of bleed Amblin. Um, <laughs> sure. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> you know, those are those are really the movies. <laughs> I was that, not expecting that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the, um, those are really the movies that I grew up with, and the movies that really stuck with me are that you know I grew up in the great era of you know each summer it would be. Gremlins, Goonies, Back to the Future, E.T., things like that. And I really love things in that kind of warm-hearted adventure adventure space. And, and I really tried to, uh, you know, make something new with this, but, but, you know, wear our influences on our sleeves at the, at the same time. Mm -hmm. And you're going to, you guys are going to be blown away by the soundtrack in particular. Uh, my, my friend Bear McCreary did it. And Ooh, uh, great it's, composer. Yeah. And it's nothing like, it's not like the Tycho drums of Battlestar Galactica, but it's not like I think everyone's going to be expecting a synth score like uh, like Stranger Things, and instead this feels like it feels like a lost John Williams score from like 1985. Cool, sold, it. very very in. Uh, you mind getting into some fan questions with us? Absolutely. Uh, we we've got a couple really cool ones. Let's um, let's, let's, let's uh, Roxy sing. Oh yeah, let Roxy sing. Let Roxy I always sing. forget. Mrs. Benny. <laughs> The Jingle Queen. Thank you, yes. Roxy. You're uh, so welcome. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit Marvel. Uh, Alex asked, uh, in light of the Mandarin's potential return to the MCU, uh, uh, Feige did a, a Reddit AMA, I think, and someone asked, will the Mandarin ever come back, or have you considered it? And he said, yes. Yes. Um, I think in that sort of just general Feige doublespeak. Uh, um, are there other characters from the MCU, villains, heroes, are there are there characters that you guys would love to see come back? Uh, whether it is... Oh, I have such an answer. Ooh, let's go. Justin Hammer. Yes, <laughs> yep, yep, yep. I mean, come on, you've no got here. Sam Rockwell in the MCU mm -hmm. already. He was by far the best part of Iron... I know Iron Man 2 is not a beloved film, but he was great whenever he was on screen. And who better to step into the role of Tony Stark with Tony with spoiler alert Tony Stark gone than someone who is at least as good as Robert Downey Jr. at playing these kind of uh, oh my God you're half a douchebag but I kind of love you at the same time <laughs> yeah um, characters yeah well you've got such a cool opportunity to do like a reverse Iron Man with Thunderbolts or, or yeah something I, like that. I would love to see Justin Hammer leading the Thunderbolts I think you know and and I, I'm I'm fond of you know, as you probably know, because I wrote the Booster Gold screenplay, um, I, I am fond of the characters who are not quite as cool as they think they are. Mm -hmm. You know, like Tony Stark is as cool as he thinks he is. Yeah. Justin Hammer is the guy who's yeah. really trying to be yeah. Tony Stark <laughs> and kind of failing at it. And, yeah. and I, I want to see, I want to see that on screen. Yeah, there's just something so fun there. Rocks. 
Uh, I completely agree. I think that's a great one. The person that I just... It, I'd be nervous to bring back, but also the character is so underutilized and I feel like there's a million things we could do with her that it's going to get some O's and O's. Natalie Portman, like how how she was so um, just like cast aside. Yeah, no, it was uh, there. She was great as Jane, and as Jane she, Foster. She just, there were... There's something. She's such a talented actress, and to have her on board in the MCU, and then to have those two movies with her just as that, mm-hmm. I feel like we should have a whole Jane show, like a whole something. <laughs> Who is she? What is she doing now? I feel like she'd be like like Jane Foster would be the great team leader because physics are kind of her physics are kind of her big thing. Like you mm-hmm. can imagine her mm-hmm. like with the superhero, you know, like like if you did like the all female superhero team of like the the team leader and the brains of the the brains of the outfit. Yeah, she'd she's be, running she'd plays. Be, she'd be great as that. Just you know, so as, cast as the aside. Professor X of the Professor X of the uh, of the MCU. Yeah, I'd, I'd be super. Yeah, she was really. Kind of underutilized, yeah. especially you know once you hit uh, Thor: Dark World, where yeah. she's very much a damsel as opposed to sort of Thor's charismatic equal. And because you got to, I mean, that's that's you. You got to. It's like, don't you want to see more now? Where, I mean, she was so great, and then now she's no, yeah, I, not I'd in love, it. I'd love to see more of her. Heck, I'd love to see more Darcy. Um, that was my that was yeah. my pick. I love oh. I love Darcy. ensemble players in in comics and pieces like this that this is what I think the big strength of both the first Thor movie with the Warriors 3 and Jane's entourage and say Ant-Man uh, with his crew she's I, great too yeah yes. I, I think those ensembles are so fun and if, Maybe the two when you of them. mix those when you mix those bags up I I think that kind of thing is is so so cool like what what does Darcy look like working at Stark? You know, at at Stark Enterprises or working in for the Avengers now? Like she's somehow, you know, her her new internship is working in the Avengers facility, stuff like that. I, I just love taking just like, oh, this piece doesn't quite fit, but that that's the fun of it. Like putting characters like that into sort of odd roles. I agree. I was gonna say Hella. Oh, her too. Kate Blanchett is too good to be one and done, and yep. I would bring her back because they were at different narrative points, narrative in their story arcs. She and Loki were in opposition when she came into the MCU, and thus had to be enemies. I think that I would love to see them as they now are, what what we assume to be the Loki series to be, which is a shoot, an offshoot of the alternate timeline now, where he escaped the Battle of New York with the Tesseract. I would love for the for the for them to fold her into that timeline and get a great like deliciously evil Loki and Hela team up so that you don't have to force them together. See, I, I, I here's where I thought you were going with that. I I think Loki works better as an anti-hero than a the than as an outright villain. Mm. And if you have Hela and Loki in a show together in a movie together, you can have Loki as untrustworthy as he is as the center of good because he's a, it's like you think I'm bad, that's pure evil over. Mm-hmm. That's that's delicious pure evil, but evil nonetheless. Mm-hmm. Um so the idea of like Loki having to find his best self because he's up against against someone who's much, much worse than he is yeah. um, it, has a lot of potential. It's interesting that, that we chose uh, all Thor people. Like, that that's the franchise I that mean, we want to see. One, I think that his supporting cast, cast honestly, has, been has been the one that's been the least utilized And we set up things in the first I, two things, and then it's just, that I want to see more. I really yeah. love Sif. I think it's such a shame that uh, scheduling didn't work out. Because uh, I think she was doing yeah. the, 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 the tattoo. Dead, like yeah, the rest she would have been dead. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. yeah that's, I wonder if she's like, fair. I have a sh- I can't. Yeah, I got to do my tattoo cop I'm show. Busy. I can't. Sorry. Zach, guys. I feel like you have to be the one to like bring them together now. <laughs> now, and come full circle, all of like the we'll Thor miss. You, you got my. They, they have my number. They're, they're, they they know I'll come back if they ask. <laughs> oh, you um, have to. I love that. Alex also specifically asked about uh, anyone else from the Incredible Hulk movie besides Thunderbolt Ross. I mean, that's a, 
phenomenal cast of people yeah. in there. You've got um, uh, you, so you've Tim got Roth. The, yeah, Tim Roth is the leader. Tyler, Tyler. Yeah. yeah, pretty good at the acting Liv thing Tyler. herself. Yeah. You've got yeah. Tim Blake Nelson uh, sitting on the bench yeah. as the, the Samuel Stearns as the leader. Yeah. You got a big yeah. Oh, from, sorry. Yeah, you're yeah, right. Ryan, Ryan, Ryan yeah. yeah or JT? Yeah, he does a Ryan. Yeah. Oh. Got a full on Ryan. Yeah. yeah so I mean the. There are a lot. I won't call it a weakness because it's not. You know, you can't play every player on your bench. You know, at all times. But I do think the MCU has just like a deep bench yeah, no, the of MCU toys to play with. Al- the MCU is almost like the the Bruckheimer movies from the from the nineties, where they ha- you know it was like there was always like Nick Cage at the center, but like the supporting cast was just like a murderer's row of these yeah. great indie actors. Yeah. Yeah. You've got your work cut out for you now, Zach. Start right. Yeah. Yep. Do you think that the Phase One supporting cast, the, your Howling Commandos, uh, cinematically, your Peggy Carters, your Howling Commandos, your your Warriors Three, the the people that w- were in uh, the Iron Iron Man got his own three of his own movies, so his supporting cast had time to get fleshed up. But do you think because Civil War got folded into Captain America and then Winter Soldier and, and S.H.I.E.L.D. and all that was folded into the second Captain America movie, Thor uh, just kind of had its own kind of crazy advancement as a franchise? Like, do you think that some of those supporting characters, because they were written in so early, got lost in the shuffle? Incredible Hulk with Betty and Thunderbolt and uh, like, yes, th- Incredible Hulk never got a sequel, yeah. so there's always the challenge of new toys. It's just growing yeah. pains yeah, that I, a lot of those never got brought back. Yeah, I, I, I think so. And I, you know, I, I think I, I wouldn't say they were in a hurry, certainly not compared to DC, but uh, mm. but they were they were always going, they were always headed for crossing those characters over in these mm-hmm. bi- in these big events and when you do that then you know you have freaking Idris Elba is you know playing playing you know your your fifth or sixth lead but yeah. you know where are you going to put Heimdall in an Avengers movie the yeah. answer is you kill him off in the first 5 minutes yeah well i, I was I rewatching the first thor the other day and it is one of those movies where you go back and you're like that's Idris Elba. Like, yeah. he has ten lines. That's yeah. insane. Yeah. He's like one of the biggest stars in the world now. Uh, it's it's like going back and um, uh, I think a few months back to just research for movie fights. I rewatched Lady Hawk, and it's that cast. You're like, that's Michelle Pfeiffer and Matthew Broderick, like in a weird fantasy movie. Like, that's this, bizarre. It's nuts. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 I, I went to uh, the great producer Lauren Shuler, Shuler Donner's office, and she has. The freaking sword from Lady Hawk. Cool. And wait, even better, the double barrel crossbow from Lady Hawk in her awesome. office. I'm like, man, if the zombie uh, the zombie <laughs> apocalypse happens, uh, Lauren is going to be set. By the way, very good double feature of movies you need to check out if you've never seen them: Dragon Slayer, Lady Hawk. That's a pretty good double feature for it's sure. A pretty good nerdy double feature. Um, uh, just cast ass. Uh, I really like this conversation talk. Let, let's let's close out with this. Just Cass asked, isn't subverting expectations by definition not giving fans what they expect? I can understand creators wanting to do something bold, but why are traditionally hands-on executives suddenly so on board with subverting expectations? Do you think it's possible that they're intentionally capitalizing on the discourse between fans? Um, so obviously there's there's been a lot of this uh, sort of talk about uh, the idea of subverting expectations in scripting, whether it's The Last Jedi or whether it's it's uh, the last season of Game of Thrones. Um, hey, you write scripts. Um, <laughs> yeah. what, what are what are your sort of uh, what's your definition around the idea of subverting expectations within writing a script? I th- I like subverting expectations. The only thing that I would say is you need to be consistent about it. Mm-hmm. If you set up a universe where this is going to be about giving the people what they want, albeit in unexpected ways, mm-hmm. and then suddenly in like the fifth or sixth entry, you start going, oh, maybe we won't. Maybe we're going to start turning things on their head. Then I think it's not, it's not illegitimate for the fans to say, wait a second, it feels like you're changing up the rules on us. Can you mm-hmm. give an example, Zach, or do you um, don't want to? Well, you know, like stuff, one I theory. really liked the I really liked the Last Jedi a lot, but I understood why some people were why some people were dissatisfied with it because it felt like they were it felt like they were changing up the rules in in midstream a little bit. Sure. Even while I appreciated the boldness of some of the creative choices, whereas in contrast, Game of Thrones was all about. Um, 
you know, like, l let's take the tropes of heroic fantasy and drag them through the mud and blow mm -hmm. them up. It's like, oh, we don't, you don't, you don't kill kids in fantasy? We're going to kill a whole bunch of kids, you know? It's like, yeah. we're yeah. going to chop off Sean Bean's head. Spoiler. Um, we're going to do all of, uh, you know, we're, we're going to do all of those things. And now, uh, you know, and now people are shocked and angry or not everyone but some people are are seemingly shocked and angry that they're that they're you know following through on these promises that they made from the very first episode do you think it's because there's no consensus anymore and voices on both sides can be just equally as loud because i, I was thinking about star wars for example the force awakens comes out and there's a very vocal and loud contingent saying like Ugh, this is awful. I hate it. It's just a remake of The New Hope. There's nothing new. Another Death Star. It's everything I thought it was going to be. It's, uh, you know, it's, it's just a retread, a rehash of everything else. Okay, that was a very loud contingent when that movie came out. And then The Last Jedi came out, and there was another loud contingent. It's just like, oh my god, this isn't Star Wars. This isn't anything like I, I, a Star Wars has ever been. This is completely different. It's a complete departure. And I feel like the, a little bit the same with Game of Thrones, which is like uh, spoilers for this new season, if you haven't been watching, but with the Battle of Winterfell and Arya and the Night King, you know, there were so many people just like, oh God, Arya kills the Night King, that's the most fanfic thing ever, like, I can't, you know, oh, it's just so cheap, and then you build that up just to have this up, but then Daenerys' turn in the last episode is just like, wait, no, this character's been built up, I can't believe this, and it's like, and I know a lot of it's about development and stuff like that, but it does feel like, the way that social media and stuff works now is it almost doesn't matter what you choose because there's going to be an angry side on either way. Mm -hmm. I, I yeah, I've I've come around to the idea of you know you don't ignore social media because sometimes you you do find useful things from it and and useful feedback, but at the end of the day you got to tell the story that you're telling and know that not everyone is going to be happy happy with it and try and be true to yourself and try sure. and make something that's that's creatively satisfying. Um, and also remember that at times, what's going on in social media is not reflective of what's going on in the broader public. That right. you would think that it's like, oh, this, and you see that all the time. It's like, this actor, this movie is hated. And it's like, oh, this this movie made $1.6 billion at the box office. Mm -hmm. That's a yeah. lot of hatred. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I think to uh, specifically address part of this question, though, that says, I can understand creators wanting to do something bold, but why are traditionally uh, hands-on executives suddenly so on board? I think that part is because there's so many places you can go now as a creator that if these execs don't give you creative freedom, you will go somewhere else. So if I think the execs at HBO know what they have as a gift with Benioff and Weiss, and if they're not going to let them have the freedom to do what they want, then obviously contractually speaking at this point they would have had to finish out, but they're not going to want to work with them again. Mm -hmm. Benioff and Weiss aren't going to want to come back to HBO. So I think the execs are getting smarter knowing that they have to give their creators creative ability, or they will just call Netflix, or they will just call wherever Amazon, anybody, and say, peace. Yeah, and also I, I think in, in terms of that creative uh, that creative freedom, it's you can either do two things with expectations. You can either fulfill them, hopefully mm -hmm. in an unexpected way, or you can subvert them. It's kind of a binary thing. And if people have seen the expectation fulfilled, or you know met ten times, then that really how you distinguish yourself from the pack is no. I'm going to give you the opposite of what you of what you thought you were getting. And and I, I've noticed a really interesting thing is some of the most subversive, especially TV shows, come from people who did something very mainstream before that. And it's almost like they're trying to they're they're like trying to work out their issues and, In real and time, yeah. do the opposite. Like you know, like Ron Moore did Battlestar Galactica, the the reboot. Um, which was, you know, shocking at the at the time for how it embraced the kind of uh, you know premium cable model model for storytelling and science fiction, and no one had really no one had really done that. But he was coming off of Voyage, you know, of uh, of the Star Trek franchise, so a lot of it felt like I'm going to do all the stuff that they wouldn't <laughs> let me do there. Right. You know, Sean Ryan spent like years and years on Nash Bridges, the most mainstream cop <laughs> show ever, and then he went and did The Shield 
world, which like it's like let's take the cop hero and blow him up, you know, like yeah. blow yeah. him up and and turn him on its head. So so it, it's interesting to see how 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 often that's the case with people who who want to subvert expectations. Even George R. R. Martin, he was a TV guy. For everyone forgets, he was a TV guy mm -hmm. for like twenty years. And hasn't he said that the reason that he made Game of Thrones the way that it was is because he struggled under the TV system of having exactly. to deliver the same thing yep. over and over? So, yeah, it's... it's uh, which le leads us to the final question, Zach. Uh, what were you getting out of your system when you wrote Rim of the World? <laughs> <laughs> what was I getting out of my system when I wrote Rim of the World? Um, you know, I was getting out of my system the idea that everything had to be a $150 million movie based on underlying IP and characters that people were familiar with. I loved the idea of working from a blank sheet of paper. I, I, what I was getting out of my system was not being able to start with a blank sheet of paper. And, and the, the freedom of being able to do that and create new characters for people to hopefully fall in love with was uh, was incredibly appealing to me. Well, dude, we're super glad you did it. Yeah, uh, thanks I can't for coming wait. on the yeah, yeah. Oh, it thank looks you so phenomenal. much. It really, really does. Thank you for coming on the show, talking about it. Oh, so my pleasure. It's great to be here any anytime. Good to see you again. Room of the World, May twenty fourth on Netflix, written by this guy. Uh, before that, mm -hmm. this weekend, check out Power Levels. Check out the uh, Watching Thrones live after the Game of the uh, Game of Thrones finale on Sunday. Enjoy your weekends. We'll see you Monday. Bye, guys. Peace out.